Can you hear that? Yeah. Is that yeah? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I have been asked to introduce myself a little bit. So I am I'm me. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. No self. So just this is just this kind of my panda, so very easy to introduce. I my name is Adrian Bramali. Yeah. That's what I I'm called these days. My parents don't give me that name, but I, that's what I'm called as a Buddhist monk. Yeah. And uh, the reason I am, uh, I'm, for those of anyone who does not heard, hasn't heard about Ajahn Brahm here, yeah. everybody knows about Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? So Ajahn Brahm is the abbot of a monastery down in Perth in Australia, yeah? and I am basically a disciple of Ajahn Brahm. So he's my teacher. He's the one who ordained me, called the Upajaya yeah? in the Pali language, yeah? the one who ordains you. So this is, that's where I come from. So if I do many strange things, uh, yeah, you know the reason why that is. It's because of conditioning from Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> that's what happens when you have Ajahn Brahm as your teacher. You kind of, you know, you become like little Ajahn Brahm, yeah? And that's what will happen sometimes. So. I don't tell as many jokes, yeah? So it's going to be much more serious than Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? Uh, but the main reason I'm here is because I was invited by Venerable Chanda. You all know Venerable Chanda? Yes. Yeah? Okay, okay, very good. She invited uh, me over here basically to support her project, uh, which is the Undercover Project. Uh, and uh, the idea is to kind of build up a possibility for women to have the same kind of chance of practice in the monastic life as men have it. And this is a big problem in the world, is the, you know, the kind of inequity sometimes between the two genders. Uh, it is so much easier to be a monk in the world than to be a nun. Uh, because as a monk, you, often, you get good support, you know, not always, but a lot of the time you get good support, uh, especially if you practice reasonably well. Uh, but to be a, a woman is far more difficult uh, in, the, in the Buddhist world. Uh. So for that reason, it is, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity uh, especially, I think, now in the West, where, you know, I mean, it's quite important these days to have equity between the genders. Uh, it is something that is expected of modern society. Uh, and because it is expected of modern society, I think it is very important that if we're going to be taken seriously as Buddhists, uh, we have to try to strive towards the same ideals uh, of a certain amount of equity between the genders. Uh, yeah, at least to, to the best of our ability. Yeah. And this is part of what the Anukampa project is about. And as you all know, Ajahn Brahm is famous yeah, for having supported the Bhikkhuni ordination before. Yeah. And of course, it caused a lot of problems for him <laughs> because of that. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. And I think for Buddhism to have any chance of growing in the future, yeah, we're going to have to go down that sort of road where we try to have a sense of equality between the male and the female Sangha, but also, I think, between lay people and monastics as well. Uh, very, you know, it's very common for uh, in the Buddhist world for the monastics to be the teachers, uh, but actually sometimes lay people can also be incredibly good teachers. Uh, there's no reason why we should just have monastic teachers in the world. Uh, and sometimes you get lay people who give wonderful Dhamma talks and have a lot of experience in meditation practice uh, and who are very pure-hearted and good people. Uh, so when we can all work together as a fourfold parisa, Sometimes they call it the fourfold sangha, but that's wrong. Yeah, let's be clear about that straight away. So that's actually not really the case. What you have is fourfold parisa, which means the fourfold assembly or the four groups of, uh, of Buddhists. Yeah? So you have the, mon the monks, the nuns, uh, the lay women, and the lay men, the four groups coming together. When we work together as a group, uh, all four of us, that's what I think when we have a really strong and powerful sangha. Uh, st strong and powerful sasana, I should say. Yeah. Okay, so we have about five hours today until about three o'clock. Yeah. And uh, the idea is, I think, to divide the day up into two halves. Uh, so we're going to kind of go on until maybe 12 or just before 12, and then continue, have lunch, and then continue afterwards. So uh, that's kind of the idea behind this. Uh. So it is a day of meditation, but also when I teach meditation, I also like to teach Buddhism at the same time, because obviously the theory and the practice go together in the Buddhist teachings. So it's a great opportunity to learn a bit theoretical about meditation practice, also a little bit about the Buddhist teachings, 
then do some meditation at the same time. But it's a very powerful combination because when you, the idea of meditation is to calm you down a little bit, yeah? Feel a bit more peaceful, feel a bit more at ease, uh, feel a bit more at home in yourself, yeah? You can relax, you can feel good about yourself. Uh, and when you really relax and you feel good about yourself, uh, you can actually understand the Buddhist teaching so much more easily. Yeah? And when you understand the teachings better, it feeds back into your meditation. So it's like a kind of a, a synergetic effect between uh, a meditation practice and actually uh, understanding what the teachings are all about. Uh, we're going to try to do that today as well, combine the two a little bit uh, and see what comes out of that. Uh. But what I will do first of all is to start off with some basic instructions about meditation practice. Uh, yeah, so we kind of have a foundation to get started with that. And uh, when it comes to meditation practice, uh, there are a few basic principles that I like to talk about whenever I talk about this particular subject. Uh, and uh, it is always good to start out where the Buddha himself started out. Uh, yeah, and as you may know, the Buddha started out the very first teaching that he gave about uh, Buddhist practice, about meditation practice, was the idea of the middle way. Yeah, you know the middle way, Majjhima Patipada in Pali language. Yeah, so the middle way is the very first teaching the Buddha gives. You know the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta? Yeah, the first teaching of the Buddha. The first teaching in the first sutta is the, the middle way. And this is very interesting. So it's the very first teaching, it must have some kind of significance. Yeah, if it is the very first one in the first teaching, it must be quite important, otherwise, it wouldn't be there. So this is where the Buddha starts out. And what is so strange is that when you look around the Buddhist world uh, and you look at how many Buddhists actually practice meditation, they have already forgotten about the very first teaching. Uh, yeah, the Majjhima Patipada, they chuck that out of the window and they do some kind of extreme practice instead. Uh, and this is actually a serious problem, not just outside of Buddhism, but also within Buddhism itself. Uh, and what I mean by an extreme practice here. Remember, the middle way is the middle way between uh, what is called in Pali the Atta Kalimatana Yoga. Huh? Does that sound impressive when you hear all those Pali words? It sounds impressive, yeah? This is why I say that, because you get really impressed, and then you, you, know, you listen, listen better afterwards. Uh. <laughs> uh, I've actually studied this suit quite a bit, that's why I know a little bit of this vocabulary. So, Atta Kalimatana Yoga means basically tormenting your body, tormenting yourself. Uh. And uh, a lot of Buddhist meditation these days, uh, people sit and they uh, sit with lots of pain very often and they think, yeah, I'm going to watch the pain, I'm going to get insight into pain. Uh, but when I look at people, the insight they get into the pain always, it isn't always all that obvious. Uh, yeah, I, I think, yes, you can get some insight, uh, but very often all you do is really end up torturing yourself without really going very far at all. Uh. So I say, instead of following the tradition that you find in many Buddhist circles these days, uh, where you sit down and whether you have pain or not, or whatever goes on, you just watch it and you be with it, uh, let's go back to the very first teaching of the Buddha. Find that middle way. Avoid the torturing of the body here, uh, because usually it doesn't give any results. Uh, yeah, it doesn't take you very far. Otherwise, the Buddha wouldn't have warned us against it. Uh, otherwise, it was that, you know, sit down and, uh, you know, feel lots of pain or whatever, but he doesn't say that. Uh, so let's come back to the very basis of how the Buddha taught the Dharma, not uh, using pain, stress and these kind of things uh, and try to progress our meditation in that way. Uh. And what that means in practice uh, is, first of all, when you sit, uh, please sit comfortably. Uh. Yeah, you don't have to sit cross-legged. Yeah, it's not absolutely required. These days, most people are used to sitting on chairs. And if you feel more comfortable on a chair, it is okay. You can get enlightened on a chair. Yeah, it's not as it's not bad to get enlightened. It's not the wrong kind of enlightenment if you get enlightened on a chair. And the right one when you're cross-legged is only one enlightenment. It's the same on the chair, same on the floor. So please sit on the whatever is comfortable for you. And if you do like to sit on the floor, it is okay to lean back, like you're sitting over there, leaning it back against the wall a little bit. It's perfectly acceptable as well. Some of the best meditation teachers that I know, not just teachers, but actually practitioners of meditation, very often they start off by <coughs> leaning back against something. Why? So you can relax. Yeah? Sometimes when you start off, you come perhaps from a very busy life, yeah, everybody has busy life these days. Uh, even if you have nothing to do, you're still busy because you've got all this electronic stuff here. So, <laughs> business is kind of part of life these days. Uh, 
So because of that, we need to give ourselves time just to uh, relax and find the peace within that. And when you do that, uh, yeah, that often you do just by relaxing the body, by leaning back, by sitting on a chair, whatever it is. Uh, and then, uh, when the mind relaxes, uh, and the mindfulness tends to arise when you start to relax, uh, then you can sit up straight when you feel the time is right. Uh, yeah? So, remember this. This is so important. The first teaching of the Buddha, don't stress yourself out by feeling lots of pain. Uh, uh, by tormenting the body and all of these kind of things. Find a nice posture for yourself uh, where you feel at ease, where you feel relaxed and you feel kind of good about yourself. Uh, don't underestimate this problem. Uh, this, I think it is a very uh, kind of, uh, it's one of these things about human psychology. Uh, we tend to think no pain, no gain, yeah? Is that what you think? Yeah, no pain, no gain? Yeah, everybody thinks, tends to think that. Uh, and if you look at the history of religion around the world, whether it's Christianity or Islam or whatever it is, uh, all of these religions have this idea that you're supposed to kind of fl flog yourself, flagellate yourself a little bit, yeah, whip yourself a little bit. It's good to whip yourself because that kind of beats the evilness out of you or something like that. It's terrible, yeah, it's crazy stuff. What do you mean you beat? You can't, you can't beat the evil out of people, you beat the evil into people, not out of them, yeah? The more you get beaten when you're young, the worse it tends to be. So kindness is what actually gets rid of the defilements and the problems. So you can't, you know, beat these things out of you. And this is why Buddhism is, uh, tries to be different in this particular, uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, so watch out for that, because it is a very deep-seated thing in human psychology. I think very often we think that spirituality is the opposite of worldly happiness. Uh, so the worldly happiness is kind of connected with the physical body. Yeah? So I think people think that if you torture the physical body, you are opposing the worldly happiness. Yeah? So you find a kind of neutral way. You kind of, you kind of punish yourself a little bit, that counteracts the happiness of the body, and then you find the middle way that way. It doesn't work like that. That's not how it goes. Why is that? And the answer is that if we find happiness through the body, and yeah, through the senses, or through whatever it is, then the body is important to us. Yeah, the more happiness you get through enjoyment of the five senses, yeah, well, we're seeing all the sights of the world, eating nice food, having nice relationships, or whatever it is, the more you enjoy that, the more attached you are to the five senses. Yeah, it's obvious, because you find happiness there, you're going to be attached there. And if you are attached to the five senses, you're not really going to be able to let go and go inside of yourself when you do the meditation practice. Meditation practice is the letting go of the senses, so you can withdraw within yourself. Yeah, the enjoyment of the five senses is finding happiness outside. So it is an attachment to the external world. They move you in two opposite directions. So this is the reason why we try to detach a little bit when you come on a retreat like this. Yeah, or you go on an eight-day retreat or nine-day retreat. Often you keep the eight precepts, which means that you are withdrawing from some of the sensual pleasures of the world. But the interesting point is that if you torture the body, it has exactly the same effect. Because if you torture the body, there is a problem, a physical problem, that you have to resolve. Yeah? So the mind tends to go to the body because there's a problem there. So if you have too much uh, pleasure through the body, it's exactly the same problem as too much pain through the body. The body becomes important, either because it, it brings you a sense of pleasure, or because there is a problem to be resolved. So the middle way is where we uh, try to find that balance in the body, where the body is comfortable, the body is just right, yeah, just that is. There's no pain, nor is there any particular pleasure. Uh, and when there is no pleasure and no pain, uh, what happens then? Uh, the body becomes irrelevant. Uh, and when the body becomes irrelevant, that is where you can withdraw the mind from the world. Uh, and when you withdraw the mind from the world, uh, that is where meditation happens. Uh, yeah, so no pain, no gain is not a Buddhist teaching. So remember that. Yeah, no pain, lots of gain. That's a Buddhist teaching. Actually, the Buddha says it goes even beyond that. It says lots. If you have a lot of happiness of the mind, you get a lot even more happiness. Happiness breeds happiness. If it is the right kind of happiness, so that sounds pretty good. Yeah. I, no, it's not only no pain, no gain. It's actually happiness, more happiness. That's the Buddhist teaching. So isn't that great? Yeah. Who? Who? Anyone here against that? Nobody against that. Everybody for that idea, yeah? Because it's such a beautiful idea. The more happiness you have, the more happiness actually comes out of that 
if you choose your happiness in the right way. That is the critical thing. You've got to choose the right kind of happiness, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah? So, this is the very first thing. And what it means in practice, as I said before, sit comfortably. If you start to feel pains in the body, please change your posture. Yeah? There's no competition here that you have to sit the longest. You're not competing with your neighbors. Uh, what you're doing is that you are working with you, yourself and your own defilements and your own peace and calm and your own beautiful states of mind. Uh, so just look at yourself. That's all you need to know. Uh, and then work, uh, work with that, as they say. And then you're going to make very quick progress. So change your posture. Do something else. If you get really fed up, uh, go and have a cup of tea. Yeah? Yeah, you all drink tea here. Yeah, if you don't drink tea, have something else. It doesn't matter here. And then uh, you'll be heading in the right direction. And what this uh, shows you then, it shows you that when the body starts this to disappear, uh, that is where meditation starts to happen. Uh, and uh, the next step in this uh, is then uh, uh, the idea of happiness on the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, if you have too much pain, it's very difficult to find happiness within her. Uh, but finding happiness within is actually one of those crucial elements of Buddhist meditation. Uh, one of the wonderful teachings in the, in the suttas, which we talked about very briefly yesterday, we had a talk yesterday as well in, in London, and um, one of these uh, suttas is called the uh, Dependent Liberation. Uh, so Dependent Liberation shows you how, through your meditation practice, gradually you reach complete liberation from uh, from suffering, yeah, from samsaric, from rebirth, all these kind of things. Uh, so it shows you how this happens through your meditation practice. Uh, and what uh, dependent liberation shows you, uh, what is so interesting about this, uh, is that it is all about happiness. Uh, yeah? This is kind of the powerful thing about this. Uh, so dependent liberation starts off with sila. Sila means virtue, morality, kindness, uh, habit perhaps, a character development, all of these kind of things, but in a positive way. From that sila comes lack of regret, lack of remorse. You know that you live well, you don't have anything, any remorse in your life anymore. Yeah? Non-remorse already a very positive thing. Yeah? Feeling regret is not very nice. So when we don't have any remorse, it's already a positive feeling. Yeah? From the lack of remorse comes pamuja, yeah? a Pali word which means something like joy. So because we haven't got any remorse, yeah, in a very deep sense this means, remorse can be a very profound thing. It can be like just the, the mind isn't bright, the mind isn't really, the mind is a bit grey and dull, yeah, because there's something inside of you which uh, uh, doesn't feel quite right. Uh, but when you remove that completely, the pamudja starts to come, the joy. Yeah. From the joy comes the piti. Yeah. Yeah, the pit, these are all kind of meditation words. Pity means like an enhanced form of joy, even more joy. From that piti, when you keep on doing your meditation practice, comes the pasadi, which means the calm, yeah? When the body starts to feel rock solid. And this is even more of a kind of happiness on the Buddhist path. From that calm comes an even more profound happiness called sukha. Yeah, sukha in meditation. Yeah? And from that sukha, that is where you get samadhi. And samadhi is the stillness in meditation practice. Uh, and if you look at that sequence, this is all about meditation. This is how meditation is supposed to feel from a first-person perspective, uh, from your personal perspective. If you look at that sequence, almost every word in there is some kind of happiness. Yeah? It is so kind of, when you look at that, you think, whoa, this is so uh, Marvelous. It is so wonderful. If this is what meditation is it was all about, why haven't I been meditating much longer than I already have? This is just so powerful. And so please remember that. Because what it means, it means again the idea of torturing the body, of not being comfortable, not being at ease while you do your meditation, is going to be counterproductive. If you feel tense in your meditation practice, how are you going to be happy here? You can't be tense and happy at the same time. So it gives you a guidance of what you have to do in your meditation practice. So feeling relaxed, feeling at ease, not having too much pain. A little bit of pain sometimes, of course, is unavoidable. The body is just full of pain. So let's face it, this is the problem with physical bodies. They're never completely pain-free. Uh, but we try to minimize as much as we possibly can. Uh, feel relaxation in the, in, the, in the body, first of all. Uh, then the relaxation of the mind. Moving towards a state, first of all, that is less and less suffering. Uh, yeah? Because, of course, when there's less suffering and problems, uh, we're also enhancing our well-being and enhancing happiness at the same time. Uh. 
you can see how these things kind of one thing leading into the other one uh, reducing the problems and then enhancing the well-being as a consequence uh. so remember that if you remember the very basic idea the happiness principle of meditation you're already on the right track yeah? but the right kind of happiness yeah, the spiritual happiness the happiness that comes from having a good heart uh, the happiness that comes from uh, being peaceful being kind and all of these kind of things uh, that is the kind of happiness we want to develop in this practice. So, so this is a, 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 one of those very fundamental ideas of Buddhist meditation. And another aspect of this, which also comes out in exactly the same sutta, the sutta on dependent liberation, is the idea that meditation practice is a very simple thing. Yeah, I don't know, do you think meditation is simple or do you think it's harder? Yeah, it's kind of, sometimes you don't know what to say to that question, yeah, it's, it's simple, but how come I can't do it if it's simple? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? How come it, so, it seems so, I, I can't really get all that peaceful, what's going on? It's supposed to be easy, but somehow it doesn't work out. Yeah, and, but the reality is, what could be more simple than watching your breath? It is only you and your breath, all you have to do is to be aware of your breath, can't get much more simple than that. Yeah, all the complicated thinking would do is much more complicated than watching the breath. So why can't we do such an incredibly basic thing here? And the reality is, the reason we can't do it is not because it is hard, it's not because you know, we haven't got the degree in mathematics or whatever. That's not the reason. It's not going to help you to have a degree in mathematics. The reason it is hard is because the mind isn't ready. That is why it is difficult. So it is all about all of these kind of conditioning factors coming together, and that is what makes meditation easy. Once the conditioning is right, uh, yeah, all you have to do is sit down, relax, and bam, you go into deep meditation. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Uh, you ask Ajahn Brahm, so how do you meditate, Ajahn? Oh, yeah, I sit down, yeah, I just wait, I don't do anything, just wait, yeah, and I wait, and then kind of, oh, everything just happens, yeah, and you feel like a nuclear reactor after a while because the energy is so powerful. That's what Ajahn Brahm says about meditation, you feel like a nuclear reactor. Yeah. So if you haven't got that nuclear reactor yet, it means you still have a bit of way to go in your meditation practice. So. Have you ever felt like a nuclear reactor? Sometimes, a little bit maybe, and a small nuclear reactor. Okay, you want to make it really big and powerful. So, but all you really have to do, it's so simple. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is sit back and wait. That is the ideal kind of meditation practice. And if you come back to the sutta on dependent liberation, one of the beautiful things that the Buddha says in this particular sutta, it says that when you go between these various steps, he says this cannot be done by an act of will. He uses the word chaitana. The chaitana is the will, is the doer inside of us. So this movement from one stage to the next one, to getting more and more happiness, cannot be done by an act of will. And I had always listened to Ajahn Brahm, and I said, yeah, don't do anything. Just chill. Actually, he doesn't say chill. He says, just relax. Yeah, he's a generation which doesn't use the word chill. But um, he just relax, just enjoy, yeah, just kind of don't do anything at all. And I thought, yeah, 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 whatever, you've got to do a little bit, yeah, everybody knows that. But the more, this is what you are, students, they never listen 100% to your teacher, that's impossible, this can't be done. But after a while, you realize that actually he has a very good point. And what is so powerful is that when you hear a teaching from your teacher, which you are kind of not entirely sure about, and then you go to the suit as you go to the word of the Buddha, and you see the Buddha actually says exactly the same thing. Yeah, so here is like the teaching of your teacher and the word of the Buddha matching completely, standing side by side. Then you realize, actually, there is something very powerful to what Ajahn Brahm was saying. Instead of saying, yeah, 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 whatever, you know, I'm going to do my own thing, you think, cheapest, you had a point, yeah. Why haven't I listen, been listening to you? He said, the problem is very hard to listen 100%. And so then it reinforces itself, and it becomes a very important teaching. And then you realize that what we have to do in meditation is really just to be patient, just to learn to relax, just to learn to be at ease, just to sit back and wait for the process to happen by itself. And when it happens by itself, it is so easy. Yeah? Can't get easier than that. All you have to do is sit back and wait, and the whole thing happens. Incredibly easy. Yeah? Of course, the reason why it doesn't happen uh, is, again, because the foundation work isn't actually there. Uh, you haven't actually done many of the things that are required to, for, for this process to actually take uh, its natural course. Uh, and that foundation work is just simply things like being kind, being compassionate in your life, uh, 
I'm sure, I know that all of you are already very kind people. Uh, yes, you're kind people, right? You wouldn't be here otherwise. What on earth would you be here for if you weren't kind already? So I know that people who come to meditation retreats already are very kind. Uh, but the point is that the Buddhist, the Buddha sets the bar very, very high. So even though you are kind already, we need to up our game even a little bit more. Yeah, this is kind of the point of the, of the Buddhist life. So we keep on upping our game more and more and more until we kind of gain a degree of purity when meditation becomes automatic. That is why it doesn't work. And that is why the idea of sila, the idea of kindness, the idea of all these things is kind of is so important and why it is so much part and parcel of what meditation practice and the Buddhist path is all about. But keep it simple, yeah? keep it incredibly simple. Just relax, be at ease, watch the breath. That's really all you have to do in your meditation practice. And it makes it very uh, natural and easy and unproblematic. So, and uh, what happens when you do that, uh, uh, if you're able to do it in the right way, you're just able to sit back and wait, uh, what happens is that you find that your mindfulness starts to arise as a consequence. Uh, yeah, you come here, maybe you feel a bit tired, you feel a bit overworked, you've just been driving an hour, driving is already quite tiring in its, in its own right. Uh, so instead of trying to fight that tiredness or fight the restlessness of what you, whatever you have, uh, you just sit back and you allow things to settle down. Uh, and as you allow things to settle down, uh, the peace and the joy and the mindfulness, all of these things tend to arise all by themselves. Uh, and this is the best way to become mindful. Uh, very often people say, yeah, I've got to be mindful. Yeah, I've got to really try very hard to be mindful. But if you try too hard to be mindful, what you often do is you often deplete the mind of energy. Yeah? Because the very fact of trying, yeah? the very fact of using energy actually depletes the mind. And then mindfulness actually goes down. Yeah? But if you do the opposite, yeah? you just sit back, you just enjoy, yeah? you just have a good time. Yeah? You don't use your mind very much. Yeah? The reason why the mind is depleted is because you use it too much. If you do the opposite, you allow the mind to be, the mind rests, the energy comes back. When the energy comes back, the mindfulness arises again. And that is where things kind of start to come together. And it's very beautiful when that happens. You can feel almost the clarity coming inside of you. Yeah, The defilements, the hindrances kind of disappearing. And clarity arising just by sitting there, just by waiting, and by allowing things to arise in this way. Yeah? So to enable the mindfulness to come uh, in this way, uh, there is a few little hints, a few little things, uh, a few little, if you like, uh, nudging the mind a little bit this way and that way, uh, to uh, kind of... Uh, uh, Push the mind, if you like, in the right direction. And one of the most important things to do in your meditation practice is to have the right attitude. Yeah, it's so important. If you come to the meditation, you're feeling a bit negative, yeah, or you know, you're kind of grumbling about this, grumbling about that. You've just been watching too many news on TV, yeah, that's always a bad idea. When you watch the news on TV, you usually feel pretty miserable afterwards because news is like uh, all the worst things that happen in the world compacted into 20 minutes, yeah? No wonder you feel depressed if you watch the news. This is not what life is like, you know? This is kind of really just seeing the worst things. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you just feel bad for whatever reason it is. Uh, so one of the most important things is to kind of get into the right mood in the meditation situation. Uh, and this is one of the great things of coming to a Buddhist Vihara like this. Uh, coming uh, to see like-minded people who are thinking in the right way. Uh, yeah, and maybe hearing a little bit about the word of the Buddha. Uh, and this creates an atmosphere, it creates a mood uh, where it becomes nice and you feel at ease, you're enjoying yourself. Uh, some of the negative sides of your personality kind of they get put into the background a little bit uh, and you kind of feel more positive about things. Uh. So having the right attitude is so important. Uh. So while you are here today, try to kind of feel the beauty of this place. Uh. Yeah, it's quite, quite quiet here. It's quite nice. Yeah, not too many noises happening on. So kind of tune into that sense of serenity and the beauty and the quiet of this place. Yeah, tune into the feeling of the good company that you have around you. Yeah? One of the wonderful things to always remember when you come on a retreat like this, as I said before, here you are surrounded by other people, like-minded people, who also practice kindness in the life, who do good things, who keep precepts. 
What a wonderful thing it is uh, to be surrounded by people like this. Uh, yeah? And what a rare thing it is to find in the world people who are so uh, committed to kindness, committed to the right thing. Yeah? What a wonderful thing that is. Uh, yeah? These are like your kalyanamitas. Uh, these are like your spiritual companions. Uh, and allow simple thoughts like that uh, to lift your mood and to make you feel better. Yeah? But ultimately, the idea in Buddhism about uh, uh, lifting our mood and having kind of the right a perspective on things and having the right attitude really comes back to our own practice, how we live our ordinary lives. And if you live your ordinary life well, if you really practice sila to the best of your ability, then when you come down and you sit down and you do your meditation practice, you will tend to feel good about yourself almost automatically. Yeah, because you know inside of yourself that you feel uh, good because you're living in the right way. You have a kind of quiet uh, contentment and happiness about yourself. Uh, and that is really the ideal way of giving rise to the right attitude. Uh, because you know that you're living well. Uh, you come to a peaceful place. All those thoughts come back to you as you do that. Uh, the Buddha has this beautiful simile in the suttas. Uh, it's a simile of the mountain. There's many beautiful mountain similes in the suttas. Uh, and this simile of the mountain uh, is like, the Buddha says, it's like a, uh, you know, a person, uh, uh, or a, a simile is of, the, of a big mountain, and there's a house on the side of this mountain. Uh, and in the evening, when the sun goes down behind that mountain, uh, yeah, the house in front of that mountain is completely enveloped and completely immersed in that shade from the mountain because the sun goes back be but down behind the mountain, the house in front of the mountain gets completely immersed, completely subsumed in that shade coming from the mountain. In exactly the same way, says the Buddha, uh, when you live your life really well, then when you come back home in the evening, you're kind of sitting down and you're resting, and maybe lying down or whatever, and you're calming down a little bit, then the mountain of good actions that you have lived, yeah, so you really have to kind of commit and persevere in kindness and goodness. The mountain of good actions that you, uh, that you have lived with for, during that day and also during the months and the years in advance, they come back to you and they envelop you and you are immersed in that goodness that you have lived in your life. And then you feel good about yourself, yeah? You have this quiet sense of happiness about yourself because you know, yes, I live well, I'm doing the right thing. It's not a kind of ego trip at all, it's just a quiet sense of happiness and contentment with your own life. And it's very beautiful when that happens. And this is kind of the idea, yeah, with meditation practice. When you sit back and you close your eyes and you just try to be at ease and relax, this mountain comes back to you and you feel happy as a consequence. So this is what we're trying to do. So build that mountain a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say here. And the bigger that mountain is, uh, the more kind of uh, uh, immersed you're going to be in the shade of that mountain when you come to a retreat like this. Uh, and this is really what the idea of sila nusati is all about. Uh, the idea of recollecting your own virtue, re recollecting your own kindness, uh, and recollecting how you actually live your life. Uh. And then there is the Chaga Nusati, yeah, which is very similar. Chaga means uh, generosity in the Pali language. Uh, yeah? Very similar kind of thing. Yeah? So sometimes you just allow your mind to uh, drift back to something that you have done in your life. When you were kind, you did something to support somebody, you did something nice. Uh, you don't force these things too much because if you force them too much, they don't work. Uh, but you allow your mind to find these beautiful moments in your life. Uh, uh, moments that inspire you when you feel good about yourself. Uh, and when you kind of bring yourself back to those uh, times when you did something specially good, uh, you can feel a certain degree of joy arising in your mind. If it works, it doesn't always work, but if it works, the joy kind of arises. Uh, and that then becomes the foundation for right attitude, the right way of looking at things, and becomes incredibly supportive for your meditation practice, uh, whether you're watching the breath or whatever else that you're doing here. Uh. Yeah, so this is the idea of right attitude. Having a sense of gratitude is another way of looking at it. Yeah? Being here on this retreat, uh, having a chance just to be with like-minded people. Somebody is offering this hall for us to be able to be here for the day. Uh, in the world. Yeah, there's wonderful teachings by the Buddha which leads us out of suffering towards more and more happiness. Uh, if life is about anything, surely it's about that. Yeah? That's, what, that's what everything is about. We're all searching for happiness in one way or another. Right here, you've got it. This is what it's all about. Now we are kind of immersed in those teachings. That actually leads us in the right direction. Wow, what a wonderful thing that is. 
And when you have a sense of gratitude, it's one of those powerful emotions that, again, uh, makes purifies your mind in a very beautiful way. Yeah? So all of these things are ways of having right attitude uh, and looking at things in the right way. Yeah? So remember that. Uh, remember the idea of uh, a positive attitude, an attitude of uh, uh, remembering your good qualities, uh, remembering having a sense of gratitude, remembering uh, positive things in life, and then uh, uh, you'll be heading in the right direction. Yeah. One last thing here. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot, isn't it? Uh, please don't remember all this. Forget it as soon as I said all of these things. Yeah. Let it go out of the window and just meditate afterwards. Yeah. And just saying the thing. Because sometimes it's kind of nice to have, especially if you hear things you haven't heard before. Yeah. Uh, so one last thing is... Uh, uh, about also about attitude, but it's more about having right view, looking at things in the right way. Yeah? Because how we look at the world, what our priorities are, what our values are, yeah? what actually is important for us in our lives, uh, also has a very powerful influence on how our meditation works. Yeah? Yeah, and one way of thinking about this, and this is actually strange from the suttas, again, everything I say is from the suttas, not, not everything, a lot of what I say is from the suttas with commentary added. So, uh, the Buddha says in some of the Satipatthana suttas, uh, he actually says that there are two things uh, that are the support of Satipatthana practice. Uh, those two things are, surprise, surprise, sila on the one hand, yeah, our character, our habits, our morality, and on the other hand is something called ujjukaditi, yeah. And Udrakadita means straight view, looking at the world in the right way. So one way of thinking about this, one way of thinking about looking at the world in the right way, is to remember your priorities. Remember what actually is important in your life. Now, if you come on this retreat to enhance your ordinary life, yeah, you come and think, yeah, when I do this, I'll become a much better you know, family member, I'll become a much better manager when I go back again, yeah, I'll become, in my work, I'll be far more efficient, or, you know, I'm doing this so I can kind of go and enjoy, you know, you read about Ajahn Brahm, he says, oh yeah, after meditation, you can see so much more colors, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this after I can see all these beautiful colors afterwards, yeah. So, if you do meditation practice, so it enhances the rest of your life, if that is your purpose, then what happens is that uh, uh, it means that your rest of your life is your priority and meditation is secondary. Yeah? Because you use using meditation to enhance the rest of your life, the rest of your life is number one, meditation is secondary. Yeah? And when that is your priority, what happens? Yeah, surprise, surprise, what happens is that when you sit down to meditate, you're going to think about the rest of your life. Why? Because it is more important. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? So because we make those things important in our lives, you sit down, you can't get it out of your mind. You think about problems back home, you think about your work, you think about your family, you think about your house, all these kind of things, because it is priority. After all, we meditate to help us in the rest of our lives. Yeah, That's how many, many people think. And because they think like that, meditation doesn't go very far. Yeah? So what I would recommend to you, and this is actually very powerful if you get it right, uh, is to reverse that. Uh, Make the spiritual life your priority. Yeah, spiritual life is number one. Everything else you do in life, whether it's your family life, your work life, your whatever it is, all that is secondary. All of that you do it to enhance your spiritual life. Spiritual life comes on top. And if you're able to do that, see it in that way, it turns the whole thing upside down. And suddenly, because now you are really coming here to do meditation, obviously it's about our spiritual life, because this is what it's all about. Yeah, you can let go of your ordinary life, because it is secondary, it is not so important. Yeah, that is, your ordinary life is there to support your spiritual life. It means that when you are living your spiritual life to the full, which is meditation practice is all about, you can let go of your ordinary life. You get the right priority. You get things in the right order. And this does not mean that you become kind of callous or, or don't care about your family anymore. You don't care about your job anymore, any of these things. That is not actually what it means. What it actually means in the end of the day, if you uh, put more, if you make your ordinary life into an aspect of your spiritual life, everything gains from that, both your ordinary life and also your spiritual life. So it actually has, an, uh, it has a benefit, beneficial effect in both aspects of your life. But by getting the priorities right, it means that these things will not obsess your mind so much when you come to do a spiritual practice, whether it's meditation or whatever else it is. 
Yeah, and then you start to also transform the way you deal with things in your ordinary life. It means that you start to understand that how I live with my family members, how I do things at work, actually has a very powerful effect on how my meditation works afterwards. So, so you make your work life, you make your family life, you make everything else into an aspect of your spiritual path. It's very beautiful, yeah? And when you do that, you find that everything tends to work out better as a consequence. Ooh, paparazzi has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that is why, <laughs> this is how it works. So get, try to get things in the right order. Get your priorities right. Uh, and as you do that, this is what we mean by Ujjukaditi, remembering what really matters. It is in meditation, when you start to touch things like Samadhi, when you touch mindfulness in a deep way, that is when you feel that you are touching the very meaning of life. This is where you find the meaning of life. You don't find that ever in the same way in, your, in the rest of your life, but you find it here in your meditation practice. This is where you find real depth and real profundity inside of you. Really fast. And allow that process to happen by itself. The more things settle down initially, just by observing it happen, and the more mindfulness tends to arise as a consequence. So just stay with your body and just feel the body initially yeah, and feel the mind yeah, and allow things to settle down just by being patient, yeah, not by doing anything at all really. Yeah. And as you do so, the process tends to happen almost automatically. Yeah. Yeah, too, too much, too good. <laughs> okay, that's always the danger of meditation. Eat too much afterwards. Oh. So, okay, so I thought because of that problem, because I know that problem already, I thought we'd talk a little bit first. How's that? Yeah, just to kind of get over the worst of the, uh, the, uh, the lunch. So uh, I thought uh, just maybe talk a little bit, not too much. Uh, and then we can have some more meditation afterwards, and maybe we can have a bit of discussion or QA towards the end. Does that sound, sound good? Yeah? Okay, great. Five pieces as well, okay, whatever. Well, however many pieces you want, yeah, we recommend five, but if you can only do four, that's okay as well. Do have how many you can, uh, yeah, but zero, we don't do zero, we do either one or five or, or whatever else. So, uh, uh, the, uh, what I thought I'd talk a little bit about, I, as I mentioned before, one of the kind of fundamental things that make meditation possible is the idea of sila as the <coughs> basis for meditation, because you feel good about yourself, uh, you know that you're living well, and when you sit down and become peaceful, you actually have a natural sense of happiness with yourself. Uh, and this is so important in, on the Buddhist path. Uh, and uh, of course, to enable that sila to become stronger, one of the most important things is the idea of metta. Yeah, the word Pali word metta, which uh, often translated as loving kindness, uh, or it can be translated simply as goodwill or friendliness and all these kind of things. Uh, these are all valid translations of this word. Uh, Actually, the word metta, it comes from the word mitta. Well, mitta is the same word as we have in kalyana mitta, so it means like friendship, basically. You're friendly towards people, that's really what it means. So. And the idea of metta, the basic idea of it, is that you see the positive qualities in other people, and when you see the positive qualities in other people, you tend to wish them well, yeah. You don't, if you see somebody and you think, wow, they're such a wonderful person, it's very hard to wish them ill. You know, naturally wish, wish them well as a consequence. So, um, how do we actually develop this? And I want to just very briefly have a look at a very short sutta by the Buddha where he talks about uh, the six qualities that lead to harmony, lead to cordiality, lead to friend, friendliness, lead to kind of love and respect, etc. 
uh, six qualities that the Buddha talks about. And uh, this is uh, quite interesting because these six qualities are obviously uh, things that I mentioned a few places in the suttas, uh, so they are kind of fundamental principles that uh, we need to put into practice. Uh. So, uh, <clears throat> the first thing that is interesting about metta is that very often in the Buddhist world you are taught about metta meditation. Uh, yeah? You sit down, you wish all beings, may you be happy, may you be well, all these kind of things. Uh. But the Buddha actually starts off with something that is much more basic. Yeah? That is the idea of practicing metta, practicing kindness uh, in your ordinary life. Metta through action, rather than metta as a purely mental thing, wishing other beings well. Uh, and that is where it starts out. Uh, yeah, this is what the Buddha starts with. Uh, and uh, the reason, I think, why, the reason why it starts with that is because it is far easier uh, to do these things by action. It's both easier and more difficult because sometimes you don't feel like doing things. Uh, but it's basically easier than do, doing it in your mind as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, often it's very hard to give rise to these positive feelings, etc. So you start with the easy stuff, first of all. Uh, don't forget that. So practicing metta in your ordinary life towards your fellow uh, fellows in the... Uh, Buddhist life, but also anyone else for that matter. You know? And this is how the Buddha describes this. A very simple little uh, teaching. This is from the sutta called the Kusambhya Sutta. It's in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 48. Uh, and this is the Buddha's description of this. And uh, yeah, What he says, he says, because, because is the monks, uh, there are these six principles of cordiality that create love and respect uh, and conduce to cohesion. Uh, to non-dispute, to harmony, and to unity. What are these six? And this is after the monks have been arguing and quarreling. Uh, yeah, uh, you aware of that? Monks arguing and quarreling. Uh, yes, happens. This is it's bad, bad. Happened at the time of the Buddha. Already happening. Uh, yeah. So this is kind of human nature. It happens everywhere. Uh, so the monks were arguing, but the Buddha was not too impressed. Yeah, and he was pretty. Uh, down on those monks, and this is what he told them afterwards, after they kind of cooled off a little bit. And you can't say anything to somebody who's angry. Yes, impossible. You have to wait for people to cool down, and then you can talk to them afterwards. And this is how the Buddha usually works things. So, so he says, what are these six? Here, a bhikkhu, a bhikkhuni, a lay man, a lay woman, everyone is really included in these things. So, uh, one of the important points about the suttas of the word of the Buddha is that very often, the suttas are spoken to the bhikkhus, to the monks. But remember, that that doesn't mean the teachings are just for the monks. What it means, the reason why it is like that, is because when the Buddha addresses a large assembly, uh, the kind of the, the most senior participants in that assembly will often be the bhikkhu sangha, yeah? because they have been around since the beginning. They are usually in the majority because they are around the Buddha. So he addresses the monks. But actually, it means that everyone else is also included because they're often actually present. They're often there taking part in the, uh, in, uh, in the talk or listening to the talk or whatever it is. Uh, this is something you see, this is a little quirk of the Pali language that you always address the most senior person in the assembly regardless. So you say, for example, if you have lots of monks around, you will say, the Buddha says in one place, it says Anuruddha, sir. Yeah, the name of the senior monk is Anuruddha, so he calls them all Anuruddha, sir, in the plural. Yeah, yeah, they will kind of become part of Venerable uh, Anuruddha. Yeah, that's how the Pali, Pali works. So it's kind of strange. So when you hear the word bhikkhu, you are not excluded. Yeah, you are part of it. <coughs> Otherwise, I can only talk to myself, which gets kind of boring. Yeah. <laughs> so you're all part, part of this. So, so don't feel, feel kind of left out. Here, a bhikkhu maintains bodily acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is that principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to harmony and to unity. Yes, yeah, so this is the first one, loving acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards your companions in the holy life. And uh, so this is where it starts out. So basically we try to act with loving kindness in our acts towards other people. And uh, it is e in one way it is quite easy to do this because you can express your love and kindness outwardly without necessarily feeling it. Yeah, you can still be kind even if you don't feel a kind of a massive kind of meta inside. Uh, you can still act with love and kindness towards people around you. It is like a training ground. Uh, you're training your mind to look at the world in a different way. Uh, 
when you uh, force yourself, not force yourself, but you try to incline yourself towards being kind to other people, uh, it actually does something to your mind. Uh, it's as if you're dragging your mind along, yeah? Because your mind wants to kind of, uh, otherwise you have too much cognitive, what I think they call a cognitive dissonance, uh, whereby the two aspects of your mind kind of clashing together. Uh, so if you encourage yourself to be kind to the people around you, to be friendly, to do acts of generosity, yeah, helping people out. You're actually kind of dragging your mind along a little bit. Even if the mind is not 100% into it, you're kind of learning, teaching yourself how to look at these people in a more positive way. Yeah. So simply by doing acts of kindness like that, you're actually changing your attitude and the way you look at the world changes as a consequence. And I remember, I, you know, I I don't travel all that much to see other monastics, but occasionally I do. And uh, I, a few years ago, I went to Thailand and I visited a very famous Thai monk called Ajahn Ganha. Ajahn Ganha. Have you heard about Ajahn Ganha? Yes? No? Ajahn Ganha? No? Okay. <laughs> some of you have. I know some of you have, but uh, not so many of you. Ajahn Ganha is this very famous monk in Thailand. He's a very good friend of Ajahn Brahm as well. Uh, and he has been to our monastery a few times, lived there for a year on one occasion. Uh, and he's famous for his metta practice, yeah, for having such enormous amounts of metta. So when you go to Ajahn Ganha, because he's so famous, there's always a large crowd of people sitting around him, yeah? And sometimes these people are foreigners, they don't understand a word of Thai here. So Ajahn Ganha sits there, he doesn't talk very much, he just sits there, yeah? He looks around the people, <laughs> doesn't say anything, yeah? he doesn't need to say anything, because the presence is so soft and so nice. So, so people just sit there to kind of absorb the vibe, yeah? The vibe of Ajaganha. And when they absorb the vibe, they feel really good about themselves and really relaxed. And it's kind of marvelous to see that because people are attracted like magnets, yeah? Kind of, Ajaganha is here, people just involuntarily walk in that direction. Even though they should be going this way, that way, kind of they and be drawn as a magnet towards Ajaganha. They have no choice in the matter, you know? And this is what is like if you have a lot of metta and kindness and friendliness to other people. People are just drawn towards you. And they sit down there, yeah? They don't know. He doesn't say anything. So they just sit there in his presence. And you feel kind of slightly foolish just sitting there. What, what now? <laughs> and uh, nothing really. And, and sometimes he might, if you're lucky, he might say something. Yeah? But more often than saying anything, he has this little things that he does. And one of the things that he does, I saw this with my own eyes because I was actually there. Yeah? He has this enormous tray of sweets. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely large. It's kind of, you know, I don't know, a cubic meter of sweets or whatever. It's just enormous. So. And then he has a little dipper, yeah, the dipper that he dips into the sweets uh, and then looks at the crowd and he throws the sweets out of the crowd. Uh. <laughs> so it's like it's raining sweets, yeah. <laughs> And it sounds, it sounds a bit crazy, it sounds a bit mad when you hear about it, but when you're there, it's actually very beautiful, because he's such a sweet character, yeah? And the fact that it's raining sweets, it almost is a symbol of the metta, yeah? The kind of sweetness is raining down on you. Yeah? So it has this double, double meaning to it. Yeah? This is what he's like. One of the kind of nice things about, you know, these monastics and people that practice the, uh, the spiritual life for a long time, they have, often have these little quirks, these kind of weird little things, yeah? They're really kind of different from ordinary people. Uh, and when you hear about it, it sounds really crazy. When you see it, actually, it's very natural and very easy and very understandable why it happens. Uh, so this is what he does. And then, because I was there, uh, yeah, the first thing, I, I'm going to tell you a secret, right? Uh, you promise not to tell anyone else. Uh, you really have to promise. <laughs> well, I guess it's, it's okay. So it's not really a secret, but the, the thing, what, because he has a very close relationship to Ajahn Brahm, the first thing, because I, I'm, you know, I try to be very clever, yeah, I not, not always succeed, but try to be clever. So I, I went there, the first thing I said, I'm a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, as I said to him, first of all, yeah, because once you have that connection, it kind of creates something extra. And because I was a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, he kind of took me to, to one side and spoke to me for hours afterwards. So he's this monk who was very, very busy. He took me around, driving around, and all over the place. So. And while he was talking to me, usually when, the, when an Ajahn is very senior like that, uh, you don't have much chance to talk yourself. They usually talk to you, as you know how it works, in, in especially in places like Thailand. Uh. But I got the chance to ask him a couple of questions. Uh. And one of them, obviously, because he's so famous for his metta practice, I asked him, how do you practice metta? What is kind of your secret? You look pretty happy, you know. Uh, I didn't say that, I kind of thought that. Uh. <laughs> and uh, so how, what do you do? And I thought he would say, oh, you sit down, you close your eyes, yeah, you said, may all beings be happy and well. But no, he did not say that at all. And 
what is so interesting about some of these teachers, uh, you know, whether they are arahants or whether they are stream anchors or whatever they are, uh, there's something about them in the way they teach, which is often very down to earth, very simple, very straightforward, nothing fancy, yeah? because they know that the simple things in life are the things that work. Yeah? So whenever you hear teachers that are too fancy, you often you often you have a you know, basis for wondering whether these actually really are the best kind of teachings to hear. Yeah? The teachings that are simple, easy to put into practice, that you can use in your everyday life. They are by far the most powerful ones. And this is what an Arahant understands, yeah, because they know the human mind, they know how we are. We need simple things to be able to persevere and commit to the Buddhist practice. So what he said instead, he didn't say, you know, sit down and sit kind of say, may all beings be happy and well. What he said was that every day when you wake up in the morning, yeah, the first thing you should ask yourself, how can I be of service for the world today? Yeah? Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. This is how you have metta. <laughs> okay, this is quite cool because it is very practical. It means that you go out. You, you uh, anyone who crosses your path on that day, you find out how you can say a nice word to them, how you can be of assistance, how you can maybe be generous, uh, how you can have a kind thought to the people around you. Very, very practical and very, very down to earth. Uh, and this, I thought, was such a beautiful thing. And of course, then you read the sutta as a. And the first thing the Buddha says is exactly the same thing, yeah? Have metta in body towards the people around you. That is the very first thing, yeah? So, uh, again, very fascinating. Of course, as we do that, and as you turn your mind towards metta, whether your mind wants to or not, the mind is a bit stubborn, you're going to pull it along like a donkey sometimes, uh, and when you do that, it works. A uh, bit of a carrot, a bit of stick. Uh, not, actually, no stick, just carrots. Uh, this is the kind of the kind path, but just carrots. Uh, and uh, as you give it just carrots, uh, then, uh, you know, kind of the donkey kind of gradually, grudgingly comes and it comes after, follows after you. Uh. So uh, that is how it works out. Uh. And uh, uh, the, the nice thing about how the Buddha here phrases this thing, which is kind of always the, the beautiful thing about the word of the Buddha, he always adds things that you don't hear in ordinary life. The Buddha always has a broader view, a kind of wider uh, vision of things. Uh, you can hear Dhamma talks in the, you know, for your whole life and very often it is slightly limited because the person has a certain angle, has a certain character which they follow. The Buddha is like, he encompasses pretty much the entire vision of the Dhamma, the Dhamma is about. Uh, so all of these other people's ideas are encompassed by the Buddha's teachings. So, so that's why when you read the suttas, very often you get ideas that are slightly different. Uh, this is what is so beautiful about it. Uh. So what the Buddha, again, had to say here, just to remind you, you have acts of loving kindness both in public and in private. Yes, this is this idea of integrity, the idea that you are not, you know, you don't kind of do one thing in public, yeah, you kind of smile in public and then behind the back you say bad things, that's not very Buddhist. You have an integrity about it, whether you are sitting in your room by yourself or you're out in public or whatever, you have the same kind of attitude at all times. Yeah, so this is the first kind of thing here, the idea of integrity in the practice. Uh, not to be a hypocrite, obviously, is what, what this is part of. Uh. But the other thing that is interesting here, when the Buddha talks about this, he says that you have um, metta in public environment towards your companions in your holy life. Uh. Yeah, he's talking to the monks here, so that means I should have metta towards my companions, my fellow monks. That's what it means. Uh. Don't have to worry about you guys, yeah, I can worry, forget about all, all, all the lay people, is that right? Uh. Is that correct? I can just kind of lay people, no, the monks, have that what the monks, lay people don't matter. Is that what you think, is that what he's saying here? Maybe, maybe not. I think the point of this, and this is, uh, I think, what is kind of the purpose of this, is to say that uh, if the, pri the, the primary focus of our metta should be those people who are closest to us, uh, because they are often the people who are most difficult to have metta towards uh, yeah, if you think about family life, because you are so close together, and because there always is a bit of rubbing up against each other, a big bit of friction, it is very easy sometimes for tempers to fray a little bit, yeah? And, but if you can have metta towards your family members, uh, for me that's almost <coughs> like my fellow monks, if I can have metta towards my fellow monks, uh, we have to see every blooming day, have to see these fellow monks, yeah? After a while they get on your nerves, yeah? This is just the nature of things. If I can do that, wow, then I'm really set in metta. Uh. So this is the point. It's easy for me to have a bit of metta towards all of you, yeah? I only see you once every 
Well, I've never seen mostly before, so once, <laughs> once in a lifetime, perhaps, yeah? So how can you not have met that if you see someone once in a lifetime? It's easy. Those people you see every day, that is where the hard work is. Uh, and that is where we have to kind of emphasize the idea of metta. So remember that. If you are able to have metta towards your family members, uh, towards your work colleagues, uh, towards those people who are closest to you, everything else is a piece of cake, yeah? No problems at all. So easy. So that is where we need to start out. Uh, so focus on that. Uh, and I have tried that very much in my own life. Uh, uh, and one of the kind of the remarkable things that I have found, because when I first decided to become a monk 25 years ago, whatever it is now, 20, something like that, uh, I said to my parents that I want to become a monk. I said, what? Are you crazy? What do you, you know, what do we do all this upbringing for? You know, we have kind of paid for your university fees and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, our upbringing has failed. Uh, so my father said to me, our upbringing has failed. I thought, what is it, <laughs> what is it talking about? Uh, and uh, of course, the reason why he said that was because they didn't have no idea about Buddhism. They thought Buddhism was some kind of dangerous cult, yeah, where you kind of get dragged in, you get brainwashed. Actually, you do get brainwashed, by the way. Are you aware of that? Yeah, this is what's happening now. It's brain. This is brainwashing, yeah? I hope you are clear about that. It is actually brainwashing, but it is a... It's a, uh, what is called, benign brainwashing. It's not a bad one. So, uh, and because of that, they were obviously very much against it. But what I found, and this is the, shows you the power of these teachings when you practice them in the right way. Uh, what I found is that after treating my parents nicely, they were shocked, yeah. He was this young rebel, this kind of teenager doing all kind of bad stuff. Suddenly I treat my, my parents in a good way. They thought, geez, creepers, creepers. There must be something good about this Buddhist teachings, but it changed so much. Gradually, gradually, they come around. Yeah, gradually they change. And they start to look at Buddhism, the Dhamma, the fact that I'm a monk, in a completely different light. Yeah, there's a kind of this... It takes a long time. It took about... 10 years, yeah? So you've got to be very persistent. You've got to persevere. First of all, you have to know that what you're doing is right. Then you have to persevere. And one day, my father, of all people, is the last people in the universe who's supposed to listen to you, yeah? My father came to me and he said to me, you know, I used to be your teacher, now you're my teacher. Yeah, yeah? isn't that kind of remarkable? I was shocked. I thought I was going to fall over when I heard that. <laughs> it's not supposed to happen. Your father doesn't say this kind of stuff. And now he listens to my talks on YouTube, yeah, and I can still can't believe it's, it's actually happening because it's kind of such a, it's like a miracle. But um, it, it has happened, and I think the reason why it has happened is be precisely because I've tried my very best to not to convert my parents, I forgot about that pretty much straight away, I knew it was going to backfire, but just to be kind, to live the spiritual life, to live the Buddhist life in the right way. And that actually is incredibly powerful. It turns things around. Everything really changes because of that. And that is just an example of what it does, just within the family life. Yeah? If you do it well, consistently, over time, it is incredibly powerful. And never give up. Yeah? Never, uh, it's never kind of... Uh, you almost have to keep on doing it. Uh, this is the thing. Yeah? And then it has this kind of effect. So this is the... Uh, then the basic idea of metta, just act it out in your everyday life, in private, in public, especially towards the people who are closest to you, and then it tends to broaden out from there and encompass everybody as a consequence. And the Buddha says exactly the same thing for speech, yes, that kind of makes sense, speech and body action, they go together, and then he says it for the mind. Yeah, you're supposed to have metta inside of you, mentally, for all the people around you. Yeah, sometimes you may be able to kind of grudgingly be kind to somebody, but inside you kind of, you know, you're, you're seething a little bit because you did something bad. But even mentally, we're supposed to have metta for the people around us. So, and this is where it gets very interesting, because if you are able uh, to live with metta inside of you to, or, to other people in ordinary life, uh, that is when the meditation starts to become possible, yeah? If you, in everyday life, are able to be kind to other people inside and outside, then when you sit down in your meditation, that's when the meditation starts to work, yeah? So this is, uh, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the Buddhist training here. How can we do that? Uh, how can you have metta towards people in everyday life? Uh, and uh, the trick for doing this is really to learn how to look at people in the right way, uh, 
Yeah, to understand people, to understand what people really are like. And the more you have a proper understanding, the right outlook, the right, um, um, uh, what is the, uh, yeah, anyway, I think the right outlook really, really is actually probably good enough. The right outlook on people, looking at people in the right way, then actually everything tends to fall into place. So, yeah? so the first thing, if you're, going to have to have, if you're going to have meta towards other people, the first thing is to obviously overcome any negativity or ill will you have to anyone in your life. Uh, yeah, of course, sometimes there are people that are very difficult, uh, but generally in daily life, how to overcome the small little problems that we have. Uh, and one of the most powerful techniques, uh, and I was talking about this yesterday, is very simple, but very, very powerful is to always remember the Buddha's teaching of non-self. And the consequences of the non-self teaching are actually very profound when it comes to metta practice. Because non-self means, it means that there is no core inside of us that makes decisions about what is right and what is wrong. The reason why people are the way they are is because of conditioning. Yeah, they have come to be like this because of their upbringing, because of their schooling, uh, because of uh, the circumstances in their life. Uh, and of course, from a Buddhist point of view, also the circumstances in past lives as well. Uh, all of these things together is what makes you the person you are now. Uh, yeah, who are you now? You're the person you are now, but what you feel like at this very moment is just simply the sum of all the conditioning that comes from the past. Uh, so in a sense, our personalities, uh, how we live the things that we do, are in a sense, they are like a program. A program that was somehow written in past lives, uh, and now it is compelling you, it is forcing you to live and to, uh, to, uh, to express yourself in a certain way. You have no choice, uh, because the program is actually running your life, rather than you being in charge of what you're doing here. Uh. And it is very, in many ways, it is very counterintuitive. Uh, because if you look inside of yourself, it feels like you have choices. Uh, yeah? It feels like, yeah, now I'm choosing to do A, I'm kind of avoiding B, I'm choosing to be kind, I'm not choosing to kind of do bad things, uh, whatever it is. Uh, it's very counterintuitive. But the more you understand the nature of the mind, uh, the more you look at yourself in a kind of neutral, unbiased way, uh, the more you will understand that you actually are basically the product of the cause and conditions that work on you. So watch yourself very carefully here and you start to understand why this actually is the case. And as you do that, yeah, the more you do that, you, of course, you also know the same is true for other people around you. And when you understand that people are the product of the cause and conditions that work on them, you can't, they can't really be responsible anymore. Yeah, how can they be responsible for their badness? It's rather, what, what is kind of remarkable is that there's any goodness at all, because there's so many bad cause and conditions in this, in this life sometimes. So you kind of rejoice about the goodness, but the badness, you understand that actually there's nothing that, that the person really probably can do about that. Which is a very interesting and alternative way of looking at the world. And once you understand that, once you understand that people act badly because of cause and conditions, uh, and you also understand that the majority of people actually want to be kind. Uh, yeah, if you had a choice, would you like to be kind all the time or would you not? Uh, you probably would, uh, yes, uh, because you know that kindness is connected with happiness. It's intuitive. Yeah? We know when we're kind to others, we feel good about ourselves. It's a natural intuition. Uh, so everybody is, to a very large extent, like that. Uh, if they could be kind, uh, they would be kind. Uh, but the conditioning is so powerful, it overrides their ability to be kinder. And that is kind of sad, isn't it? You want to be kind, but you can't do it. You're act, you want to act in your own best interest, and also the best interest of other people, but you can't do it. You are trapped, in a sense, by your own personality, trapped by your own conditioning. Nobody is able to step out of their personality and do things differently. That is what we have become. That's what we have to act according to. So once you do that, instead of getting angry with people when they do bad things, uh, yeah, you have compassion for them, uh, because you know that they are trapped with that terrible mind state, uh, trapped with that conditioning uh, that uh, stops them from living the life that they really want to, want to live. Uh. So if you're having problems with a work colleague, yeah, if you're having problems with anyone in this life, uh, uh, 
uh, try to remember this, that they are, in a sense, like a robot. Uh, they're like a robot that run on a program that was written sometime, long, long, long time in the past. Uh, and those habits are carrying on uh, very often from one life to the next one, on and on and on like that. Uh, and once you do that, you actually start to be able to forgive, maybe not all people in your life, uh, but a large number of people in your life. You can forgive, uh, and you can let it go, and you can actually have compassion for them, rather than get upset about them. Uh, yeah, so whether these are the workers in your back garden not kind of working hard enough, or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is in, in life, there's always kind of difficulties in life, uh, you can actually have compassion for them, because you know, actually, they probably want to work really hard, these workers. Yeah? They probably want to do the right thing, but there's something inside of them stopping them from doing the right thing. Yeah? So, and then, uh, what happens next? Yeah, this is the first step, if you like, to kind of overcome anger and ill will. Uh, and the second one, then, is how do you move from there to metta? And to move from there to metta is to learn to see the good qualities in other people. Uh, people are often very complicated. They have negative sides, they have positive sides. Uh, and if you are able, and if you focus very carefully on the positive sides in other people, uh, yeah, something remarkable starts to happen. Uh, you have to do it again and again and again. You have to forgive the negative things, and you have to think how remarkable it is that people actually have such wonderful qualities. Maybe they are generous. Maybe they have something else which makes them special. And as you focus on that, and you do it over a long period of time, you start to see the other person in a new light, and you start to have a sense of friendliness, of metta and kindness towards them instead. Yeah, this is how you, this is straight from the suttas again. Everything I said, say, is basically taken from the suttas. So this is how the, this is actually Venerable Sariputta who gives this particular sutta. This is how he recommends that we develop metta for people around us. So, so this is how you do it. Do and it, but only when you come here on the retreat. Yeah, it's only once, once a lifetime. Is that not enough to come on this retreat, which is once a lifetime? Actually, there are other ones as well, I guess. So, so maybe they count as well. Um, so you do uh, have to do it continuously, yeah, with persistence, uh, with commitment uh, over a long period of time, and that is actually when it makes a difference. And that is when it changes your whole attitude. Your mind starts to point in a different direction. Before you were reactive to the circumstances around you, now when you see people doing the same kind of things, uh, you start to react in a completely different way. Yeah? And it's very beautiful when you see that happening inside of you, yeah? You see this change of perspective, this change of looking at other people. It's very wonderful and marvelous when that happens. You feel that you are growing in Dharma qualities. You feel something profound, really profound, is changing inside of you. And the world starts to look different as a consequence, yeah? I'm very glad that nobody here knows me from 20 years ago. Is anyone here who knows me from 20 years ago? Okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, you know, I have been doing this practice for 20 years, and I have changed quite a bit. I, I reckon anyway, in those 20 years, uh, 20 years ago, I was, you know, I, I would have been embarrassed if you knew me 20 years ago. So now, kind of things have changed, and now I'm kind of, I don't feel quite so bad. Maybe 20 years time, I look back today, and think, wow, jeepers, uh, that was really embarrassing what I was doing then. Uh, maybe, uh, let's see what happens. So. So, uh, but my point is, it works, yeah, it works, it does change you. And when I uh, look at my monastic life, the only thing really that keeps me as a monastic is the sense that there is a movement towards something better. There's an improvement going on, there's a change where the wholesome qualities are increasing, the unwholesome qualities are going down, on the, in a kind of, in a general sense. And that is what the, is the purpose of the Buddhist life, the purpose of the monastic life, uh, as long as that happens, uh, you know, you basically are going to continue on this path for sure. Now. So, and then, as you uh, practice uh, uh, the metta in all of these ways, by body, speech, and mind, uh, yeah, overcoming the negative qualities first of all, uh, building up the positive perceptions, uh, as you do that, you can then start to do the metta meditation in practice. Uh, sit down, wish other people well and happiness, uh, and as you do that, you can develop uh, you know, the happiness and all these positive states of mind inside. Uh, to do that, just to give you some hints on how to do metta meditation in the right way, in a way that works, uh, there are many ways of doing this. You don't have to follow what I say. Uh, this is just kind of the way I, I found the most effective uh, to do it. Uh, and uh, so, 
to, to do this, first of all, it is so important that you have the right perception of the person, the people, the whole world, whatever it is that you're sending metta to. So the very first thing that you have to do is build up a perception in your mind of something positive. Yeah? So, and when you see people in a positive way, looking for the good qualities, that is when metta becomes possible. So very often you start off your metta meditation just by reminding yourself that there are lots of very good people in this world. One of the great things about being a monastic, I was just talking to Venerable Chanda before about this, one of the great things about being a monastic is that you meet so many nice people. Yeah, that's good enough reason already to be a monastic. Would you agree with that? Yeah? <laughs> okay, that is a challenge, yeah? That means that you have to become a monastic later on. Yeah? <laughs> That's already good enough reason, really, because whenever you travel anywhere in the world, not whatever, not always true, most of the time it's true, you meet so many nice people there, and what a wonderful thing that is. Uh. And then, because of that, uh, you remind yourself, actually, there is a lot of goodness in the world. Uh. Don't watch the news, yeah, because you see all the badness. Watch the, watch the alternative news or whatever, your own news or how you actually relate to the world. Uh, remind yourself of that. Uh, and when you remind yourself of that and you remind yourself of these spiritual qualities, uh, the generosity, the kindness, the compassion, the forgiveness that exists in this world, uh, just by building up that perception in your mind during your meditation practice uh, uh, and then projecting it on to people, to the world, whatever it is, uh, that is often enough, if you do it in the right way, to give rise to the feeling of metta. Uh, yeah, the feeling of friendliness, uh, this po very positive feeling inside her. Uh. And the way that I like to do this, because this is again taken from the suttas, uh, uh, that in the suttas it doesn't start with individual people, uh, it doesn't start with kind of a friend and then the neutral person and the enemy or whatever, or you're starting with yourself actually, according to the Vasudhi Magga, uh, in the suttas, the Buddha talks about having metta to the four directions. Yeah? To the north, the south, the east, and the west. And that is often, I find that's often enough. Uh, and uh, the reason why it is often enough is because, uh, because it is a direction, uh, and because it isn't any specific person in there, because you take out the personality of people, uh, Personalities often get in the way, because once you see one side of a person, you often see the other side as well. So by taking out the personality, and just focusing on the north, the east, on the west, and reminding yourself of all the good people out there, and then wishing those people well. May you be well, may you be happy. All those beings in the, in the north, yeah, from here, we, we're traveling north later on, so you better practice the metta straight away, so we're kind of ready for the people in the north, yeah, when we get there. If you, you don't want to go there with the wrong kind of intentions. So, so we go there, okay, may all the beings in the north, may you be well and happy. Because you already perceive them as beautiful people, actually it tends to arise with less difficulty. I shouldn't say it's easy, depending on your practice, but less difficulty than it otherwise would. And one of the things that you can add to that, you know, you can also remind yourself that not only are there people in this world, from a Buddhist perspective, there are all kinds of beings like devas, yeah, people who are very pure. Yeah, this is why you get reborn in the deva loka, in the kind of heavenly realms, is because of your purity. So if you have an extremely pure heart when you pass away, you get reborn in the deva loka. And these beings who are there have tremendously developed spiritual qualities, yeah? Massive generosity, enormous kindness, a lot of metta, enormous compassion. So by visualizing these beings in your mind as well, uh, you can ta even take that metta to a higher level. Because you're seeing the beauty in the world, seeing the beauty in people's hearts and also in the qualities of these other beings. Uh. So, that is a little bit about meta practice, yeah? So, uh, hopefully that is, uh, will be useful for you. The hardest part with everything in the, the spiritual life is to commit to these things, yeah? That's the hardest part. Uh, but if you really want to make progress on the Buddhist path, uh, there's only one way of doing that, and that is to commit uh, and to persevere in all of these practices. If you, that is the hard part. If you can really commit and really persevere in these kind of things, uh, I guarantee you, you will have success. Uh, nothing can really stop you from having success on the Buddhist path. Uh, and this is part of the foundation stones for this. Uh. Yeah. Okay, but uh, how many people want to take the five precepts? One, two, 
three, four. Whoa, so many. <laughs> okay, well, let's take it all together then, because that's actually quite a nice thing to do then. So, uh, okay. Uh, so what we will do is we will just, uh, I will just uh, recite Namo Tassa first, you do it afterwards, and I will first. first. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Dhammang Sarananga Chami Sangang Sarananga Chami Dutiampe Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiampe Dhammang Sarananga Chami Dutiampe Sangang Sarananga Chami Dutiampe Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiampe Dhammang Sarananga Chami Dutiampe Sangang Sarananga Chami Sarana Ame sumi chachara vera mani sika padang samadhi ame. Musa vada vera mani sika padang samadhi ame. Sura meraya maja pamadatana vera mani sika padang samadhi ame. Emani pancha sika padani silena sugating yanti silena boga sampada silena nitwoting yanti tasma silang visoda ye. Wow, so nice. So many people have my precepts, yeah. What a wonderful thing. There's a story, there's a nice story about the in Thailand, in the time of Adan Shah. Adan Shah, of course, being Adan Brahm's teacher. And Adan Brahm tells this story. I, I don't know if it's 100% true. I can, after a while, the story is getting kind of more and more, you know, you know, you know what it's like over time. But anyway, the story is that they had this big day in the monastery, in Wat Pa Hong, Adan Shah's monastery, and all the lay people from the surrounding villages had come to the monastery. Hundreds of people, they are coming to the monastery, the day site night or something like that. There. And then Adan Shah asks all these people, he looks out, the crowd is enormous, you can't see the end of the crowd, yeah? Thousands of people perhaps probably in the monastery. And he asks them, how many of you keep the five precepts? And you know what happened then? How many of you keep the five precepts? Thousands of people, two people raise their hand, yeah? Two, this, is in, this is in one of the most Buddhist countries in the world, there are two people out of those thousands, the closest disciples, so, lay this up on Shah, kept the five precepts. So. so sometimes we think that in the West that we're not doing so well, you know, we're kind of struggling to make, it, make things work, but actually, very often what happens when people think of Buddhism in a fresh way, whether you are traditional Buddhists who come to the West and then look at it differently, or you are people who were born in the West and then take on the Buddhist teaching. So very often we are more serious about it than, than people who are kind of grown up and born with these things. So, so it's such a wonderful thing. When you see a whole room like this with so many people, I don't know, how many people are there? 50 people or something? 60, yeah? 
Yeah, everybody played in the five pace apps. Oh, maybe, maybe not everyone. I didn't actually look carefully. Eh? Anyone who didn't? <laughs> no, I'm joking. You don't have to raise your hand. So, but it's a wonderful thing. And that's also the great thing about, you know, in the Buddhist Society in Western Australia, in Perth, that we have something like 2,000 members, yeah, who keep the five precepts all the time. What a wonderful thing that is, and what a powerful thing it is. And if you do that much, you're already practicing really, really well. It's going to be a powerful support for your meditation practice. So. Anyway, so that's just wishing you good luck, and wishing you happiness, and wishing you uh, kind of all the best for your practice. And now we have to go before uh, the train leaves. Yeah, with the lantern, is that right? Train will leave. Yes, the train will leave. Yeah. So quick, we have to, we have to go. You want to say a few words? Yeah, please. Okay. You want to grab the telephone, not the telephone, the uh, microphone. Then, you know. Um, Ajahn Mali, so just a few words. Uh, on behalf of the Kampa Bikuni project uh, and uh, all of us, we all have the speakers here today and the teams we have there, uh, we're very grateful that you're here with us and given us the Dhamma here last night. I was very lucky to be there for your talk with dependent origination and then today with Metta. It's really wonderful. I think all of us will agree that. It's wonderful to get such deep down way in such a practical way, just the way that they told us. So thank you so much. We're eternally grateful, and I do hope uh, that you will visit. Eternity, you. This is not Buddhism, yeah. <laughs> so you have to be careful. <laughs> Good lesson. <laughs> um, but I do hope that you will come back again soon. Give yeah. us more time. Right. Yeah. Is that a promise? Anicca, Anicca, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know, never know. <laughs> I can yeah. jump it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, okay. We, we shall see. We shall okay. see. Yeah, see what happens. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, uh, thank you to Venerable Chanda, as you said earlier. It's a really difficult task to do. I know how difficult it is for her to organize all of these events. Uh, so we're very grateful to you, Venerable Chanda, for inviting Ajahn Brahmali getting us the opportunity to meet him, which is amazing. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for all what you're doing um, to organize the Bikuni project. Um, I would also like to thank Hiramdi, who is the person who's organized today at the Thames Vihara. So much gratitude to you, Hiramdi. I think you have been the, the sole person behind all this, bringing Ajahn Brahm and now Ajahn Brahm Ali and Renupal Chandra's introduction to me as well. So thank you. Um, just a very quick note about the Ankampa project. Um, I think all of you here know quite a bit about it. Uh, if you need to know more about it, there's Renupal Chandra Chanda or myself or lots of volunteers. Um, there is a, we are, as you know, collecting funds to uh, build the Bikuni monastery so that Renupal Chanda has somewhere to stay in England, which means we'll get to see more of her and, and more Venerables in future. So please help us. Uh, there is a, a, a little uh, donation box here and there are leaflets and if you want, lots of people have asked me uh, whether they can make direct debits. There's leaflets here, there's plenty of information on the website. Uh, so let's make the monastery a reality. Thank you so much, Sage and Hope. Okay, shall we finish off? Hey, let's take to the Sangha.